My guest today is Darren Miller from 96 Bitter Beans. Thanks for joining me. I know it's early there. Fully appreciate it. So thank you so much. And I just want to say- Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. it. It's great. I'm really looking forward to this chat for the next 25, 30 minutes. So uh, thanks for taking the time. Ask whatever you want. Let's talk about whatever you want. There are, you can't offend me. You can't bother me. You can't, you can't, um, (laughs) say anything that'll stroke my ego. I mean, you, you can, I mean, that's a, (laughs) say whatever you want is basically the point. Ask whatever you want. Then nothing, nothing offends me. Then, then we'll do that. Okay. So Synergy Restored, the new album Mm -hmm. is out the 4th of November. So that's about, about a month away now. Yeah. I'm going to go straight for the jugular on this one. I'm not even going to buy you dinner or anything. I'm just going to get straight in. Is this your best? In. Is this yes. your best album? Yeah. Did you get a copy of it? Yeah. Did you listen to it? Yeah. I'll ask you. Is it my best? <laughs> this is. Not... <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you want it? What, you... Tell me what you really think. It's okay. That's what right. I need. I don't. Don't sugarcoat it. Tell me okay. what you really think. Because I know you don't read reviews online or anything like that. You, no. you don't listen. So this is from me. I think this is the best Darren Miller project or, you know, CKY and Nice Bit Beings record you have done. And I'm so happy. I you made me very happy. <laughs> good. And and we spoke previously, like a bit before we started recording. Uh-huh. Like, um, you know, I've, I've loved Seeker Wife for a long time from volume one. Infiltrate, Destroy, Rebuild is a Bands brilliant can album. Be found. Maybe not so much. Carver City is my favorite. Volume one and Carver City are my favorite because they're crisp and they're clear. Well, and, this, um, this is coming on to my point exactly. So I think I think Infiltrate has my favorite songs on there. Yeah. Uh, um, because it's sort of like um, a part of my life where you know right. sort of, the soundtrack uh, to a certain part of your life exactly um i'm not dismissing carver city at all <laughs> like don't get me wrong but it's very when progressive I, when i listen to this uh the new album um especially on the opening of val noobs val noobs curse is that right <laughs> almost vaudeville's revenge Revenge, I don't sorry. know. You know what? I didn't do much much research on vaudeville outside of um Amer- what like what it was about in America. I don't know if Europe or any other country knows what vaudeville is. Um Please. probably not. It was how um before television and while radio was going, vaudeville was a traveling um Pretty, pretty much TV on tour. Um, it was magicians and um, dancers, comedians, um, all different kinds of things. You know, there would be nothing was off limits when it came to vaudeville, but it was destroyed by TV. And now we're kind of musicians, music bands, um, our kind of music, metal and rock, is kind of in the same position where it's been destroyed by technology. Vaudeville was a traveling way of getting people to entertain. You know, they would come into the theaters, they would pack them, sell them out. But then, you know, when um, television came about, it replaced the sound and watching these things happen. So it was basically like a circus, but what you would watch, what you would eventually watch on television. So television killed off vaudeville. And vaudeville was the word for um, putting on shows that you would later see on TV. History is repeating itself where technology is destroying all the things that you and I used to love about the kind of music that we love, going to record stores, Mm -hmm. you know, looking for things that were obscure underground that we couldn't find. And just enjoying the whole thing about music. So basically, I took the facts of that situation and turned it into a fictitious story where the vaudevillians from that time are are zombies and killing people that are into digital um, current stuff. You've You've sort of sidetracked a bit, but I'm going to follow on with that. 
point Go ahead. because the technology thing is something we always talk about um when we're talking to bands because the likes of spotify etc yeah. is killing it for the artists that is yes. uh, like and your point of going into record stores and picking up like I remember, I don't know if you've heard this band before, I picked up a record by a band called Regurgitate. Oh, and yeah. the, the album was called Carnivorous Erection. And it had an mm-hmm. erection eating a tongue on the front. And I was like, I have to have this. Right. It was mental. But gone are the days of picking that stuff up. And it's Spotify is killing it in terms of royalties and you know artists getting funded. On the other hand, it is giving a lot of people the opportunity to discover bands like regurgitate yes. and click and see right do i like this without spending 10 quid 10 pounds 20 dollars whatever you call it do you sort right. of do you sort of get at that side of the coin i totally understand that it's just not balanced out financially but yes. i'm not i'm not in this for financial reasons i'm in this for personal reasons i love physical product as you can see the vinyl is behind me and if i remove one of these vinyls there you see my vinyl collection. Same. Right. So I've never lost hope or faith in the physical format. If um if I if a song goes up that that I've done that that hits 38 million views on Spotify or streams or whatever, that's fine. You know, send me the check, I'll cash it, whatever. Can I move on with my life? I love physical formats. Yeah. And I always believed in them even 10 to 15 years ago when Slayer put out um God, what was their last album? World Paint and Blood, was it? No, after oh, that. I have repent- the box. Repentless. Out. Repentless. Um when that was put out, I said, you know what? This is the perfect album to help bring back the physical format of vinyl picture discs and they did that a limited run and i said do more you know spend some money to get it into stores that might not have carried it and they were like oh yeah you know vinyl is really gonna you know vinyl is for diehard fans and collectors that don't even have you know record players and i said you know what in 10 years vinyl is going to be the coolest thing even for kids high school kids to listen to music and everybody laughed at me, but the proof was when my daughter came home who has nothing in common with me as far as music. She don't care about the music I like. She hates metal. If I put rock on, she tells me to turn it down. But she came home one day and she said, dad, take me to Walmart to buy some Billie Eilish vinyl. And I was like, here we go. (laughs) It's happening. Walmart carrying vinyl, Target carrying vinyl, it's happening. And everybody laughed at it and it's growing. I think two or three years ago, two year, three years ago, vinyl finally outsold CDs. And an artist and the record companies make more money off a of physical product than streaming. I think that one vinyl record e- equals like 2,500 streams of an album or something. Like that. Is that right? Yes. So the more wow. the money is still in the physical product. But for me, it's not about money. I understand for other artists, it's definitely about money. But, you know, they're they're limited to only having their music streamed because they don't know about the physical product because they're not as old as me. You know, so um, part of my quest, you know, part of my never ending story is that I want um everybody to revisit the physical format and stream because part of the cool thing that was, you know, going to a record store and buying a CD is that you spent your money on the CD. Now you have to listen to it. You know, when you stream five seconds in, if you don't like it, you shut it off. Yeah. So it's hard for a band like regurgitate to get the fans they could have gotten 20 years ago because someone is going to turn on regurgitate listen to it for 10 seconds and turn it off my favorite out al- my favorite death metal album is gorgut's erosion of sanity oh. now if i had if i had streamed that album for 10 seconds i would have shut it off and never listened to it again but since i spent 18 dollars on the cd 
and I liked the Gore Guts album before that, I learned I had no choice but to say I spent eighteen dollars on this. I have to give it more than one chance. I put it in, and eventually, it caught on and it stuck with me even though it's very progressive and very not no hooks no choruses it was like guitar work but it was really confusing music and now it's my favorite album of all time but if i had screamed gore guts today i'd hate i'd have hated it it's a very good um point you've made actually that the the you know you can stream something for 10 seconds and hear a opening track which is just scream literally screams and you're like nah not yeah not today whereas if another day you put it on you'd be like okay this is what i'm into it's a very yeah. good point. Plus, um, the plus you know there's promotional money that's provided by um more you know wealthy companies that put up artists that that if i'm looking for gore guts let's say and um i'm i click on gore guts all of a sudden this this video comes up that I have no interest in at all. So it's like the more money that that the artist and their whoever represents them, usually not a record company, I don't know who it is, but you know, maybe Capitol Records wants this solo artist that does, you know, shakes her ass like Miley Cyrus or Beyonce or whatever it is, that shows up before what I want to see. So it's kind of corrupt. Streaming is kind of corrupt because they don't really go by success or, you know, even their algorithms. They like to try to um, show you whatever it is that you probably aren't even interested in. But, you know, I would like to see before a Beyonce video, when somebody wants to watch a Beyonce video or whatever, a Gorguts ad shows up. How about that? That'll be some algorithm for... Uh, Will we ever Gorgo. see that? <laughs> no, no. Metallica, that doesn't even happen for Metallica. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, we hope and dream. I'd like to have, you know, in my mind, I'm going to be the savior. I'm going to bring rock and metal back to its mainstream roots and where it started. And But you know what? Realistically, I would just like to be a small part of... Um, the return of it i think I, I mean the return of it you're certainly a big part of it back in the day when CD yeah starting out for sure um you know it was the soundtrack to a lot of people's lives certainly and especially around like you know the cky videos and the jackass sort of era yeah. um and i think i mean this is me you know i think cky still up you know, when you're in it even now, was still a part of people's lives. And I don't think it ever went away. And I think, I know what you're trying to say in keeping rock and metal and, and that. And I, I think I saw a quote somewhere, I think it was from yourself, saying you're just trying to let the teenagers know that there is other music out there, not just pop music, you know, and not, right. and not forcing metal and rock on people, but just saying, look, it's not all about Beyonce and Billie Eilish. Have a look out there. And I and I think, again, sorry, I'll let you answer now, but I think that's the sort of, your music, Darren, is sort of that gateway because it is accessible. I, th I think that might be the word. <laughs> like, New album. Yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I, I always forget to leave this out, is that there's a lot of aggressive types of hip hop that are popular, but I think that, they might send the wrong message. I think that metal sends uh, rock, and I always say metal because it's where I started, but I love yeah. rock and roll just as much. And these teenagers are full of testosterone and they have no outlet to um, release it. They don't, in America, you know, it's funny because you're the first, um, well, the second interviewer outside of the US. So we have different. You know, in, in Europe, they probably do do things totally different. But in the U.S., you're not allowed to stage dive. You're not allowed to mosh. Um, yeah. And you're not allowed to have success as a um, <laughs> rock and metal band unless you're 65 and over, you know. And I don't mean any disrespect, but um, 
the bands that get the most attention are the ones that are already filthy rich and mm -hmm. are already, you know, it's, it ends up being about money because these bands and there's maybe not so many up and coming bands that are, you know, I wish there was, and I hope to be a part of that. I hope to be a part of uh, a 19 year old saying, let's start a band, you know, yeah. getting three friends together. But a lot of these kids are loners and I see it through my teenage kids. And I think that there's a lot of aggression and anxiety and tension in these kids and they don't know where to put it. So what do they end up doing? They end up shooting up their schools. They end up bullying. They get into fights. Metal and rock stopped all those thoughts for me. Whereas it used to be back in the 80s that rock and metal caused these thoughts. Mm -hmm. Quite the opposite. They prevented, they provided an outlet you know, I remember somebody used to pick on me at, on a day of school and I would come back home and I'd put on Exodus is Bonded by Blood and Paul Bailoff would be the one that's screaming at the person that bullied me. And I felt better. I had an outlet and then going to concerts and being in mosh pits and watching stage die and just being in a in a venue with a bunch of people that felt the same way as me that were getting the aggression out and it cleared your mind and you knew you were a part of uh of a, a small group of people that were having if not the same problems as you similar problems and it worked and it it, it worked to the point where it um influenced me to start my own band and you know the rest is history we got the cky thing going and all that stuff we started the videos we had a group of friends that were completely had nothing in common with the rest of the high school. Some of them didn't play interest instruments. Some of them did. We just broke up into groups. You you uh, film some shit that's out of control, like a mosh pit or stage diving. Do your shit. We'll do the soundtrack. It had never been done before. People didn't know what to make of it. And it worked up to a point. But if it had a little bit more of a push... I think that it would be something that would be commonplace today. Here's our band. Here's our group of friends that do fucked up shit on video. And it's a little movie. You watch the fucked up shit with the soundtrack on it. But, you know, it went got to a certain point. And since, you know, a lot of people didn't understand it, didn't quite happen to the extent that we eventually had hoped in the beginning. We didn't think it would get anywhere. But we were very successful with it. And, um, Along came MTV and kind of bought it and turned it into Jackass, where CKY was a lone thing. Mm -hmm. And then on the West Coast, you had um, Knoxville and Steve-O and all that, and they were doing their thing. And then MTV saw West Coast, East Coast guys doing similar things, except, you know, Knoxville and Steve-O didn't have a band to do the soundtrack. Well, if they put them together, CKY becomes the soundtrack. And then later on, other bands tried to be the soundtrack. Maybe record companies were paying MTV, like, let us be the CKY for a little bit. And it didn't work. So if the music sucks, it doesn't matter like what TV show or movie you're in. Coming back full circle to the very point of the, like we started this conversation is your new album. And mm -hmm. I... We completely went off on a tangent there. I know, I just... Coming back you know, to it. <laughs> it's fine. Right, let's go back to it. Sorry, I yeah. wasted time. Just wanted to get that out. No, no, no. Okay, hey, that, this is fine. This is a cool chat. Uh, I was just saying the, the new record then. So as soon as I heard Vogue Vol Bill's Revenge and that opening riff, that hooky riff, it brought back that same feeling as when I first heard CQY when I was young. And Darren, you... You certainly know how to write a riff throughout. Well, on each song, actually. I mean, that's the, the that was the single Bob Bill's Revenge, wasn't it? And then, Wish Me Dead. Um, yeah, but I Bob mean, Bill's Revenge was the video, and then Wish Me Dead, yeah. and now Fire Skyline just came out a couple of days ago. Yeah, they're tearing yeah. it up, and that's a great rap song. So as well. happy. But this coming back to the actual being that your your best record, per, like. Personally, I think it is. People may disagree with me. That's fine. That's the beauty of opinions. But I think one, I think the songwriting on this album is there's a lot of diversity in it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some wicked solos on there. Which oh, are really oh my God, yeah. 
which yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't really expecting to be honest um if right. i'm being honest like i know obviously you are you are able to do it but when i heard someone was like wow that just is it, it fits so well and the second thing about this album is it sounds brilliant and i think when i talk about infiltrate destroy rebuild being some of my favorite songs i think coupled with the sound on this album and the songwriting that's why this album is your best output in my opinion i appreciate that the sound quality totally the credit goes to kenneth hunter who, who is a master shredder at guitar which um guitar shredders and soloists are you know the the subject of the the idea of them is definitely a great idea but if you're a shredder your solos better be hooky you know just like the riffs and he is a master at that and he's a master at mixing and engineering and i never really had that before in rock music in um the cky related stuff so um now that we're not you know in pro tools we try to not use i mean if you listen to a lot of rock and metal bands today you can hear the pro tools a lot of people don't know what i'm talking about but it's this music program where you can loop stuff and fix stuff and tune stuff and we try to since you know you we don't have any other options than to use digital formats to record you know pro tools and and i forget the other one um we have to use them because using two inch tape is so expensive yeah we, we don't have the budget for that. So, of course, Infiltrate, the story of Build, IDR was on two-inch tape. Volume 1 was on two-inch tape, and we ended up making it sound amazing. Answer Can Be Found was on two-inch tape, put into Pro Tools in the infancy of Pro Tools, and sounds like crap to me. And then Carver City, we just... Carver City was more of a, okay, with Pro Tools, we have unlimited tracks. So let's load up on tracks here and put them all in there. And it ended up being, I wouldn't say overproduced because I love overproduction, but you can't have everything going at yeah. once. You have to bring it in, take it down, bring it in, take it down. And that's why I think Carver City kind of uh, overwhelmed a lot of people's ears. But for this you know, it's kind of like learn my lesson. I learned my lesson with, with volume one. I learned my lesson with IDR. This is the second 96 Better Beings album. The first mm -hmm. one I, is just as good, but it was in, you know, individually, it was independently released by us. So it did, it's not going to get the, uh, the attention that Synergy Restored is going to get until we re-release it because we have no physical copies left. It's just all about streaming. So we have a lot of material to put up for streaming, but the physical stuff is personally for me and the rest of the band, they can have their opinions. We don't really talk about it much, but to have this album on a goddamn picture disc is what I've been waiting for that is great. For years. That looks great. Like. So, and what's really cool about the album being on a picture disc is that the label made it for me, for the for the for the band to sell through our store. I asked them, I said, can you print out some picture discs and some black vinyl? And I said, sure, sell it in your store. And they did. And it's just part of, you know, just rebuilding. Like I said, my dream is to be the, you know, for 96 Bitter Beings to be the reason why, you know, but that's, you know, that would be a gift of complete unrealistic, you know, the gods putting that ir unrealistic um, gift to us. But I want to be a part of it. I, I we want to be a part of um getting kids to buy record players. And the first time that I saw that that might be a possibility was when um, in ninth grade, I asked my daughter, you know, you like this song that you hear on your phone. You want me to get you a record player and you can listen to it on a, on a what we call a, a vinyl record where you put it on for the record player and you play it. She was like, God, no, that's like, what is that? But the next year, I was taking her to Walmart to buy a uh, Billie Eilish vinyl and a record player. So that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The albums, um, so Synergy Restored, Jesus, 
<laughs> and campaign. What are your What are your favorite tracks? So everybody has a different one. <laughs> my I really love Fire Skyline, and that was before it was released. Uh, like I've had this album now, I think a week, a week and a half. Mm-hmm. So I played it extensively. Um, <laughs> Ninety car pile up, I think is great. But I was driving to work the other day. Uh, it was like eight o'clock in the morning on the motorway, and I had the re- the album up really loud. Mm-hmm. And I actually, when I heard the the sample of the pile up on the record, mm-hmm. I actually, my brain for a minute, I had to look around because I thought there had been a crash, and I had <laughs> to slow down. Yeah, but, we shocked you with the crash noises, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, like had to slow down because I was like, has something happened? Am I like, like yeah? <laughs> so. Um, is that the real am- at the end of the song? Is that the real ambulance, or is that on the CD? No, that's what we wanted at, to do at the start when the the truck, you know, the horn, and then the big mm-hmm. pile up. Uh-huh. It just freaked me out. I was like, right, I need to skip this track for a minute because otherwise I'm gonna have a heart attack and have to pull over. But uh, <laughs> and that's uh, what, kind of what the point of it was is that we wanted people to pay attention while they were driving. So you know, if you hear that happening, you want to look around and make sure that you're in a safe position. And it's an anti-texting and driving song. Um, it also has <laughs> a lot of um, more of a story that I made up in my head is that, you know, I, I pictured this icy, you know, one lane street, you know, where somebody's talking on their phone, starts to skid, goes to the red light, everybody behind them skids, crashes, 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 a mile of pain and suffering and death. And the person in front is all to blame for that just because they looked at a text that says, I'll be there in five minutes. Yeah. You know, and I see that, you know, in my own neighborhood when I'm driving around, there's so many accidents and I know they're involved because of phones, because it's it's 17 year old girls crying still on their phone, texting their dads. Can you get me out of this problem? I just got in an accident because I rewritted somebody while I was texting. Yeah. That infuriates me because if anybody ever bumps into me, God forbid, it'll be an argument and a problem. But my kids out there that know not to do that, not to use their phones, put their phones away. If if God forbid somebody hits them, mm. I, I don't I don't uh, all bets are off. I might yeah, I'm gonna end up in jail. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully after I get to see some success from this record. <laughs> <laughs> my question was the um so synergy restored and camp chill was released um sorry campaign camp chill uh-huh. was, was they were recorded at the same time yes and finished at the same time so you released or or there and thereabouts but recorded at the same yeah. time um synergy restored obviously was released two three years later um Four. <laughs> What year is it? Twenty two. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, because of the campaign of the campaign, the um quarantine, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, coronavirus campaign, similar. Uh, uh, yeah, um, but my, uh, but sorry. Well, how how difficult was it for you to not tinker so much with that almost finished album as it is now? Having it on, like, were you constantly like, oh, I could change that bit here and there. Oh yeah, yeah. So it was it wasn't difficult at all to to not tweak it because I I wanted to. Right. Campaign right. campaign was released in 2018 and finished. We took the opportunity. Obviously, uh, COVID was unexpected. We took that opportunity to add and take away from synergy, and even though the songs, the skeleton of the songs, were recorded at the same time as campaign. We had a plan for campaign um, for each track to represent a different style of things that I might have done in the past, but have improved upon. And Synergy was more like a solid record that we wanted to introduce to um, post-COVID the world. world. The world, because we didn't have that power when we were doing yeah. an independent record, you know? And campaign was really successful. They're hooking up with Nuclear Blast was a no-brainer because I had worked with them in the past, and they have the power and the strength to get these singles and this album out there. And I think it deserved it to the point where 
a week before I handed it into the record company, I was still fixing things vocally. I was still adding things. So remixing, we were in there, Ken and I remixing and re-recording and, you know, doing things over because, you know, like I said earlier, when we're using Pro Tools, we, we don't like to use the quick fix where it's like, okay, this vocal might be a little out of key. Let's just tune it, you know, using the computer. I'm like, no, it sucks. I'm going to go in and sing it until it sounds good. There was a word in Vaudeville's Revenge that wasn't even a word. And I didn't even know that. Unsensitive is not a word. I didn't know that. So the chorus for Vaudeville's Revenge was unsensitive to what used to be sublime. And then somebody said, unsensitive isn't a word. It's, yeah. ins it's insensitive. So I went in there and I sang insensitive to what used to be sublime to a song that was already three years old. <laughs> I went in and, and recorded that line in 2021. It's, so it, it's interesting you say, sorry to cut across you, Darren. It's interesting you say about the vocals because it was a question I had because I don't mean to sound rude, but you're oh, older now. Good. Like you're, you're, we're, we're all getting older, and um, it's not so much in the metal world, but certainly in the in the pop world, auto tuning is the thing that is used in the studio, all these tricks and stuff. And I think your voice sounds great on the new record. So thank you. You literally, I mean, how do you keep it so fresh after all these years? Like, because I had six years of practice. We recorded fifty three songs since we've been together and wow. I never had so much time to sit there and, and try to beat myself at my own game, you know, and I'm able to hit higher notes and I'm able to hit lower notes. And for this album, I wanted it to be, it's not an aggressive record until there's parts that are aggressive. So if you're aggressive the whole time, yeah. people are like, this is, this is an aggressive song. Or this is an aggressive album. If you're if you're chill for parts of a song, you might have a joke or some in humor or whatever. When you get to an aggressive part, it's more aggressive because nobody was expecting it. And it's one of the things that I don't like about metal is that it's aggressive all the way through. Mm -hmm. Unless a band is creative enough to throw in a chill part or mellow part. But even then, the mellow part comes out of nowhere and it's predictable enough that you know it's going to get heavy again. My goal is to throw in surprises of um, maybe the whole song is going to appear to be mellow and melodic and kind of poppy, but still heavy. And then go on to things that are just like, whoa, this is kind of bizarre. You know, I, I better figure, you know, I'd like to figure out what the lyrics are. And that's one of the reasons why we left the lyrics out of the the vinyl and the cd i didn't put the lyrics in okay. there for the first time because i wanted people to um say is he saying this because if that's what he's saying that's really fucked up and that's fine i want them to um think that i want them to get their own out of it other than you know okay here's my lyrics i'm writing them out for you so that you know what i'm saying while i'm singing it that's not something that I wanted to do. And a lot of my favorite albums don't have lyrics. So I get to make up my own based off of what I hear myself. The lyrics on uh, Slither Away, the chorus, something I'm paraphrasing now, but it's a, a snake amongst the field of dead rats. You slither away or something? Sure, why not? Yeah, like... <laughs> well, I get that you know, between it's, it's me all... and you, like a, like a snake in a field of dead grass, you slither away. Like a worm that makes me squirm, you slither away. Um, is there any more? I mean, I'm, I'm on the spot here. But, um, <laughs> I don't expect you to sing the whole song. But yeah, it's like like a snake and you feel that dead grass slither away. Like a worm that makes me squirm, you slither away. Tail between your legs, slither away. So it's tail between your legs. It's um. But, there's loads of cool things like that, which when you said about not having the lyrics in there made me but think, i liked your interpretation better yeah yeah it was wrong <laughs> a few more questions darren if you don't mind okay. and, no problem um, first one nuclear blast 
So you worked with them before, but on yeah. um, World Under Blood. World Under Blood in 2010 or 11 something like that was it it was released in 2011 but we had finished it 2008 it's a completely different story and it's a completely diff different project in terms of music so yeah. nuclear blast is one of the biggest labels in the metal world you know you've got mm -hmm. um i mean demi bourgier probably on at one point you've got behemoth opeth the, the list goes on so, and then you have the, the old San Francisco Bay, Testament, Exodus, you know, Slayer. Um, yeah. Classic. But the biggest bands in rock and metal are on Nuclear Blast. And again, no. Because Roadrunner kicked the bucket. Yeah, Roadrunner have gone under a different sort of banner. They're done. But they, did lost, you... they lost Slipknot and Nickelback, so they're done. But did you not see they're doing a Roadrunner United 2.0? Another one? Yeah, see, because they need to cash in on the past. You know, I think Roadrunner surviving based off of licensing old albums such as Orgos, Annihilator, and Pestilence. And I called that. I called that because when they fired everybody that made them money, it was the dumbest decision in the world because they didn't have anybody to replace them. I think they wanted to get young kids in there to sign new bands, which they did. But by getting rid of people like Monty Connor, and all the people that made that label so much money that still have an ear for great music and that could have signed awesome bands to Roadrunner, they decided to find uh, to fire them. And now it's like, well, who does Roadrunner have except for the bands that whose contract is up, and no new bands. Mm -hmm. I think they, I think maybe Corn might be left. I don't know. I, I know Nickelback are. No, they're gone. Oh, well, they. They're not on Roadrunner. They haven't been on Roadrunner for five or six years. They're done. Oh, okay. Mom's Roadrunner sorry. Roadrunner is done. And a lot of the people that, well, my favorite person that worked at Roadrunner is now at Nuclear Blast. So I get to work with them again. And he still knows what he's doing. And he still has an ear for what's cool. You know, A&R guys don't get old. Bands get old. You know, Don Ellis has been running Columbia Records for God knows how long. He's probably strapped to a ventilator in a wheelchair and still signing new artists you know an ear is an ear and when you're not a musician and you're listening to bands you know if i was an a and r guy i would only become one because i you know being someone that plays guitar and many instruments instinctually i want to go with the better uh the bands that play their instruments really well but that's a bad marketing decision the best marketing decision is you know the songs are their hooks are the band mm -hmm. excited do they do they want to do this you know that's the most important thing do they have experience have they done things in the past without a record company that those are the things that i would look for but i'm biased because i'm a musician but roadrunner didn't have that and it's sad because for a very legendary label um now they're pretty much cashing in their chips on their catalog and that's a shame because they always vowed that they wouldn't do that, that their catalog means nothing, that licensing um, vinyl to listenable records or to Hammerheart wasn't worth an hour's worth of time. But now that's how they're surviving. And it's unfortunate because Roadrunner was the, the 80s and 90s and Roadrunner was like the best label and nuclear yeah. blast is always neck and neck but now nuclear blast has absorbed everything that roadrunner forgot to keep up with and now is the biggest rock and metal label and for for, for 96 bit of beings then being amongst mm -hmm. this roster of um, metal it is of metal yeah is one thing but for you and sorry i keep saying you like i mean the rest of the band as well obviously i, I yeah, don't yeah. mean respects when i don't mention that no. but for you my job is i think to be the guy with the notoriety and the rest of the guy's job is to be to make the whole band look good so they're just as important as yeah. i am but i think eventually they will get their notoriety so that's the whole point yeah so as i said no disrespect to them i keep referring to you but for you and for you as a band like sign is new blast that that's a huge thing and I mean, like you said, they've already given you a picture disc to sell in your store. Like they're right. backing all this stuff. Like I know labels, the, the the music scene wasn't 
isn't what it was like in the past. Like when Sabbath went in and got £250,000 to advance to record a deal, etc., etc. These oh, guy. Oh, did you get 250000 to record your records and a limo and all that stuff in advance? Yeah. For Island Def Jam? Yeah, our, our, our record deal was a quarter of a million dollars each album. Um, they licensed the first album 70 30 in our favor. We got 70 percent. Wow. Um, yeah, and there were limos, there were trips to Hawaii, there was lobster restaurants, you know. And now it's, um, but that wasn't what you know, that was nice and everything. Um, but what made all of that not as important was, um, how little we meant to them when it came to um, promoting the music, which I always thought was the most important thing. You can feed me lobster and give me money and take me to Hawaii all you want, but are you trying to uh, take this band to the next step? Yeah, so records. Right, so now that, you know, so we were, we had so many things written into our contract that we were already making so much money before we had done everything because the labels wanted us. So we, you know, Chad Ginsburg, God bless him, stepped in and he had some experience with major labels and knew that we weren't looking to sign with major labels and major labels were looking to sign with us. And that gave us a leg up where we could say, well, give us this, give us that. And that, I was so young that, you know, I money was of interest. But then being signed to Island Records for five years, I started to notice that we were being paid a lot of money, but they were keeping us in the same spot as far as getting our music out there. And that's what kind of, I kind of realized, okay, I'm being paid. It's like going to jail and they get... If you're in jail, you're in prison, and somebody pays you ten grand a day to be in prison, you don't want to be in prison. Eventually, you're like, yeah. I don't, I don't want the money. Just let me out. So it's kind of like that. It was kind of like we're paying you guys to not be big, to not succeed, and that's basically what it was. And then eventually, even though the money was still coming in from I don't know where, I had, you know, I had a conversation with them where I said. They said, okay, after an answer can be found, let's like put you in the studio for the fourth record. And I was like, why? You're just going to throw some money at us and then you're not going to do anything. And I was like, we want our music to be out there just as much as any other band that has a hit right now. We could have a hit. And, you know, they used to try to get us to, to, to write hit songs. I can't write hit songs unless there's a song that I wrote that could be a hit. But if I'm going in and saying okay i gotta write a hit song yeah we ended up with a song called familiar realm which is total garbage it's stupefied it's slowed down it's um insulting to the listener that that was familiar with how much better we could do so the industry has changed as far as how much money you're gonna get but it's not necessarily different in how much exposure you can get yeah yeah talking of uh writing hits uh, I just have to say that the the riff in in human in human creation station is one of my mm -hmm. favorite riffs of all time. I literally could listen to that riff on repeat. Now, can't oh, you oh. imagine that having been in heavy rotation on MTV or in or on your favorite radio station? Why not? Because they didn't pay the radio station to play the song. They paid us to shut up and not complain about. Oh it. man, it's absolutely <laughs> tragic. It's so good. Um, I appreciate that. Just a couple more things, and I want to quickly touch on uh, World Under Blood, which, uh -huh. for those who may not know, uh, Darren, you were, you could probably explain it better than me, but it was a death metal album, uh, album essentially, um, in 2011. It's a really good listen. You have to have a listen to it. Um, it it's got some really good death metal parts on it, but you still manage to have um, your own sort of touch on it, things that things that gave me away is it having something to do with me yeah people say that yeah you know, you're you're playing fast and you're doing death metal but i can hear the cky and the 
and your style in it. And I thought that bog that boggled my mind because I'm like, this is a completely different kind of music. I always wanted to do a death metal record and I never saw it in my future because we were so busy with CKY and touring and doing all that. And finally I got the opportunity to do it. And I thought, you know, at the time I thought it was realistic that um, I could get this other band together because we were, we were clashing and, we had all talked about doing side projects. So this was going to be my side project, but I wanted it to be a real band. And when you're getting involved in extreme metal, you're you're basically saying, OK, I'm going to do this extreme metal project. But most likely, most of the people that love my music aren't going to give mm -hmm. it a chance because it's not. And it's crazy and it's fast and it's brutal. But it was all about I wanted to do that because that's what I was listening to. I was listening to musicianship. I was listening to amazing drum playing, amazing guitar solo work. And I found Luke Yeager and I found Tim Young. And um, we did this amazing record, but it took too long. We didn't strike while the iron is hot. It was none of our faults. It was someone else's fault. And the album came out three years after the iron was hot. The iron was fucking frozen. And from there, the the you know the better some of these death metal musicians, the better they are at their instruments. Some of them don't know the business enough that that doesn't mean the more you get paid. You know, the better I am at you know it's the, the better I am at drums, the more I should get paid. The better I am at guitar, the more I should get paid. It doesn't work that way. And a lot of um, metal musicians that grew up, they don't know the business that much. So when it came time to put to, a tour together. The first thing we were offered was an opening slot for Cynic on their Trace and Air tour. Wow. When we found out when we found out the amount of money we were going to get was two hundred dollars, it was completely impractical. And um, you know, a couple of the band members, you know, I don't want to say their names because I love them, and it was so many years ago that we've talked about it and laughed about it recently. But you know, well, two hundred dollars isn't even going to get me to play a single show, so it became this problem where. We were a great band and we were we had an awesome record, but nobody wanted to tour because we're like, we're an awesome band. We're progressive. We blow everybody away as far as songs and riffs and technicality and progression. We should be getting 15 grand a show. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, yeah. The more commercial that you, your, your commercial appeal, uh, your commercial appeal decides what you're going to make financially but it, i knew i wasn't going to make any money from world under blood it's not why i wanted to do it i wanted to do it because i love death metal and i wanted to see what a, a death metal record would sound like had i done one and put together a band and that's what we did and then later on when it took so long to come out i could write a book about this album um then the, the musicians decided okay we were waiting so long for it to be finished and now like are we going to get paid no not until the record is a success. And for not having played one show, that record was was a decent success. Well, yeah. And you covered a song on that mm -hmm. by a specific... Two songs. Sorry, two songs. It was two songs. Sorry, yeah. The, the, the one that caught my attention most when you first came out was, was Wake Up Dead by yeah. Megadeth. And mm -hmm. I heard it come on, you know, the start, and I was like, Shit, this this is ballsy. This is ballsy mm -hmm. to come and cover Mega. It sounds so good. It turned out really good. And and James so Murphy good. did James Murphy and Luke Yeager both traded solos. I'm not a so a guitar. I, I'm not a lead guitar player. Yeah. I have if I'm gonna do a lead, I have to write it out. It takes weeks. These guys came in and they knew the solos, and Luke Yeager did the Chris Poland thing perfectly. And what was cool is that Dave Ellison had heard it and you know. Dave, Dave and I are Dave Ellison and I are friends. But when I asked if Dave Mustaine had heard it, he was like, "Yeah, I thought it was cool." But you know, I got a message from Dave Ellison saying how cool it was. But you no know, I don't, I don't think Dave met Mustaine really cared. That's cool. That's fine. You know, I didn't do it to impress Megadeth. Yeah. I did it because it's one of my favorite songs. And it's funny because Megadeth, I wouldn't say, is anywhere near one of my favorite bands. But I've covered two songs from them, which I find very interesting. Why did I do that? In My Darkest Hour, I covered that on an acoustic album I did, and I love that song. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's not about, you know, some some bands cover songs because they want it to get back to the original artists and see what they think. And yeah. But, you know, other, you know, 
I, I didn't care. I love songs. I wanted to cover them and put my own spin on it, just like with death metal. I wanted to do a death metal record and put my own spin on it without trying to impress other death metal bands. So, is this something you'll revisit? Do you think in the future? Oh yeah, yeah. I have. I haven't quit any band I've ever been in. Um, if my band from high school wanted to do something new and they called me, <laughs> up, I would do it. I've never quit a band. I've never said, you know. I'm out. I'm done. I can't deal with this. It's always been uh, inconvenient timing or, you know, somebody isn't going to be compensated enough. Um, obviously, you don't want to go on tour or work on something if you're going to have to pay out of your pocket. Yeah. But, you know, you do have to work around the financial aspect of it, which I hate because everybody needs to bring in money. It's the way things work. Money pays for food. Money pays for gas. So, yeah. Um, Definitely, there will be another World Under Blood record. There will be another Foreign Objects record. Um, and there, for 90, 96 Bitter Beings is going to to send me off till the end of my life. It's, cool. um, it's the band that, we're, you know, I don't want to leave this earth until we have 20 albums. 20 albums. 20, and we have two. So it's 18 to go. 18 so. to go. Greatest hits in live. They count. <laughs> they definitely <laughs> albums do not count i was right. I, funny i was having this conversation with a guy today about iron maiden and he was saying uh -huh. i've only heard five of their albums including the live uh, live after death and i was like well that doesn't have to an album yeah right i know no they're compilation records but you know what I, my friend said something to me because when i was a kid i was like god i'm just buying okay scorpions RCA, I don't know, you know, just a story. RCA signed Scorpions and their records didn't sell in the 70s. But when the Scorpions got huge in the 80s, RCA went nuts trying to fool the new Scorpions fans into thinking that the RCA albums were the new albums. So they put out all these compilations. And I remember thinking, OK, I have all the Scorpions albums from the 70s. But so why did I go out and buy Best of Scorpions? Because I have all the songs already. And the answer he gave me was like, but do you have them in this order? Do you have them? Um, do you? It's just a different listen. Back then, you didn't have the option of skipping, and you know. But like, it was interesting to see. Like, hey, what did they think was the best of the Scorpions? What order did they put the songs in? Like, how did they split up side one and side two? And it it is it's something different now. People that get carried away with compilations albums like Kiss, okay not changing or remixing anything there's so many yeah but every time they put out one it sells a lot because people are like i don't want to buy a kiss album i want to buy the best of kiss now i know you know what their game is and it's not kiss's fault it's the record company's fault because they're not selling the studio albums anymore they're selling the compilations but it's just interesting like i recently i bought the best of judas priest on cassette and it was from the 70s oh, nice because I didn't want to buy the three albums before I heard the best of. So I got the best of and I listened to it. And then I went and I got the three albums that that those songs came from. So compilations can be important unless you overdo it. And live, basically, many most live records, I'd say 99% are not totally live. But they get you interested in different versions of the song. And you get to feel like you're at the show. And they serve their purpose too, so I think they should be counted as as an album. So you're counting them as eighteen albums to go. I, yeah, I want to do, <laughs> I want to do a live record because how we sound live is completely different than on record, but we play very tight and and almost flawlessly to the point where I don't think that I would have to go in. I might have to change a couple vocals here and there, but I it's not like we're gonna have to go in and re-record everything like we did with the CKY live record. So that's how tight we are is that we can go up there, put on the show, listen to the recording and be like, God, this is badass. As long as it's mixed well enough, this will be our third or fourth record. You know, so, a live interpretations. <laughs> so talking of live then, are, are, are you in the process of lining up a tour in, I assume you've got one lined up in the States. Uh, I'm more interested about potentially Europe and any festival slots maybe. Oh God. Festivals have never, you know, I don't know what it is, but even when when we were at our peak 10, 15 years ago, festivals did not do, I think we did the download festival. Yeah. And, you know, 
I think we would love to do festivals. I would love to get in front of a crowd of 80,000, you know, I've played the 80,000 people before, but it's, it's a totally different experience and it's fun in its own way, playing arenas with guns and roses and all that stuff. Arenas are interesting, huge thousands and tens of thousands of people. That's awesome. But um, the benefit of that is that if you're lucky, 5% of that crowd is sober enough to remember who yeah. they're watching and all that. But, you know, yeah, I mean, we're working towards that. I wanted to go, we had a European tour planned that got canceled for a few reasons, but of course the biggest reason was that COVID had just kicked in. Our, our American tour, our North American tour finished a week before COVID started. Mm -hmm. And then a week after venues started opening up again in 2022, we went on a five week summer, store, summer tour that we just completed at the end of August. So right now, you know, I'm going to be hounding um, our booking agency to get us to Europe, get us a second leg. I want to do an opening slot. I haven't been an opening act in year, decades. And um, I'd like to do that. Not since Guns N' Roses have I ever been in a band that opened for another band. And I would love to do that again. Because you get that 30 minutes to... to burst out all your energy leave them like whoa and then you can get off and then already start traveling to the next show while the main act is doing their two hours we've always been a headliner on this last tour we were doing anywhere from an hour and 15 to two hour shows wow and i would like to go back to seeing what it's like to hit them and leave wham bam thank you audience you know and that's what I'm really hoping that um, we can get going. But, you know, we're still in the process of finding, we're still in the process of finding where we're at and um, really encouraging people that we're working with to do the best they can and hopefully continue to work with them. Well, I hope to see you at some point on this tour. Oh, are you I sorry? I say this tour at some point. It'd be great to see. Yeah, um, and then coming for the first synergy, I want to do March, April in Europe and cool. then come back and do another summer tour in North America. I want to, you know, touring was so much fun. Um, it was interesting. I could write a book about the summer tour we just finished. It was so fun. That's, so that's right now, Nicole. Yeah, what's going on in major cities in the U.S. right now is so fucked up you wouldn't believe it. The footage we have of people roaming the streets it's like it's like zombie geddon it's it's seriously a horror movie gone gone wild and re and realistic it's happening in seattle you're seeing people walking around naked we saw people pulling things out of their we saw women pulling uh crack out of their vaginas i mean it was wow. just insane the footage i saw there was like quite a few people that were um i guess fentanyl i'm gonna assume that were having conversations with themselves and if you interrupted the conversation by being like, are you okay? They'd be like, <laughs> fuck you, I'm talking to my friend. There's nobody there. America is trashed, East and West Coast. And then in the middle, everybody's bored. So we're in bad shape. But there's one reason why I'd like to get out of here and come to Europe, because Europe has always been good to us. They get what, what we're doing more than anybody else ever has. Fingers crossed. Final question, Darren. It's been so oh. much fun chatting to you. Thanks so much for taking Thank the you. time. I um, appreciate you having me on. But your best metal album released in 2022. Your favourite. I don't I don't have a favourite. I just don't I just have the two albums that I have bought in 2022. Okay, go. Megadeth, Sick and Dying and Dead. And Razor. Razor. Razor, album. Razor album is a Canadian thrash. Or Razor is a Canadian thrash metal band. It goes all the way back to 1985. And their new album, I don't have it in front of me, but it's called Something Contempt. Okay, cool. Um, it's They're a badass band. They they play scat beats through their whole song. The Slayer beat. And, and the, the lyrics are really funny and they're really brutal. And... and um, Dave Carlo is the founder. He's the Dave Mustaine of Razor, Dave Carlo. And uh, Bob Reed is the vocalist. And they're just, 
they they're uncompromising and they haven't put out an album in like almost 20 years maybe more oh cool. music, no hold on if you just give me one second i can look up what it's called because i really want to promote it for them yeah yeah for sure okay. um amazon all right hold on one second just five seconds razor there's another band i want to get into that sounds really interesting it's like um gunshot or gunsmith or something like that oh it's cycle of contempt i'll have it that yeah that's the new that's the new razor album cycle of contempt cool um, well, throw it on over the weekend then i i think any uh fans of uh old school thrash metal should check that out another band that i think that i'm gonna start getting into that just put out a new album is um i always forget the name but the music is so fucking cool um gunship gunship gun ship as in boat spaceship gunship Gunship. they're like sound they're like nintendo soundtrack music um but with like open-minded and it's not pop and it's not you know well i don't even know their vocals then there's another album if you like that stuff coming out they're called thought crime t-h-o-t crime and their album's coming out um the 28th of october i think they're classed as cyber grind but it's okay. uh it, it's if you like that stuff nintendo sound sega mega drive sounds you'll you'll really dig that so keep an eye out for that one as well yeah i see that okay there's a the uh, oh wait thought crimes hold on a second yeah no i would love to check out you know everybody's like you should check this out you should check this out and there's so much music isn't there i get so many yeah you can't keep up with it you know i'm still going back to gore guts erosion of sanity you know i'm gonna be listening to that probably today but yeah i gotta buy these records yeah um listen darren thank you so much for your time thank you leave you be and um best of luck with the album release and thank you very much the, the next 18 albums that are going to be out very soon <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and i hope to see you on tour someday but thanks again man much appreciated Thank you, and we'll be coming to Europe soon. I promise and guarantee it. Wicked.